Hello everyone, uh, how's it going? All good? Yeah. I'm Tom, Tomislav, I come from Croatia and I've been traveling around the world for the last five, six years. A lot of people when they hear my story, they want to know how I started, why I started traveling. So the story goes uh, back to 2007, 2008. I lived a completely different lifestyle. I was a stockbroker. I was wearing a suit and a tie on work, uh, like most of the people here in Brussels. Um, and I was kind of you know, chasing my career, earning a lot of money. I was really happy with it. And then the financial crash came in 2008 and I lost everything I've got. I lost all the money I've got. I lost my career, my job. And back in that time, I discovered one website called Couchsurfing. So uh, when I lost everything, I started hosting these people from all around the world. And when these people came to my house and told me their stories, they were like sitting in my uh, living, room, no, living room, we had a couple of beers and so on, and they were telling me their stories, how they travel all around the world. And I was really inspired and motivated because up till then, I always thought traveling was for somebody else. I always thought you have to have a lot of money to travel. I always thought you have to be very brave to travel as well. So I was like, okay, listen to, listening to their stories, and I realized that you don't really have to be so amazing to travel. You know, you don't have to be Alexander Supertramp, you don't have to be some guy in a Hollywood movie or uh, some uh, book or some documentary. All these people that came to my place were just normal, regular people like me, like most of you guys. Um, so that was the first thing that came to my mind, that I can travel if I wanted. That kind of changed everything. Second reason I started traveling was curiosity. I was really curious, you know, everybody's curious, of course, you know, little kids always want to know what's behind the bend, you know, always curious, curious, curious. I was curious, especially when I was looking at the world map that I had in my living room uh, and realizing how Croatia is really, really tiny, I wanted to know what's in this big, huge world. And I knew traveling will kind of quench my curiosity. The third reason why I started traveling was this questioning. So talking with people from all around the world, I realized that we have some different opinions, different attitudes and so on, just because we were born and raised on different sides of the world. And I thought that was a bit silly, you know, why would I have a different opinion just because I was born and raised in Croatia? I wanted to travel around the world, I wanted to get information from all our other sources, not from the media, not from my family, not from my school, not from my religion, not from my politicians. I wanted to get information from all around the world and find my own truth. And the fourth reason was education. I had my master's degree in business and economics. I moved away from my parents, but I still had a feeling that I need this big life change. You know, I needed to be more independent. I need to move away from my security bubble and just head into the unknown world. But of course, there were some obstacles. Two major obstacles I had. First of them was I was afraid. You know, I'm not the, the, the bravest guy in the world. And I was thinking, okay, how many bad things can happen to me while I travel? You know, we hear all these horror stories from all around the world, and you kind of feel that the world is a dangerous place. And the first thing I tried was to invite my friends. Well, let's go together, it'll be, it'll be fun, you know, it'll be safer and so on. But if you guys ever organized anything with your friends, you know how it goes, right? I, Two weeks before the trip, oh, I lost the money, my girlfriend, boyfriend, parents, exams, you know, and so on, job. So I was like, okay, enough with friends, I will change my tactic. So I changed my tactic and tried not to think. When I say not to think, I mean, I don't, didn't want to think about negative things that will happen on the way. I just wanted to start to travel by myself and see are these bad things going to happen or not. And of course, as soon as I started, I realized that 99.9% .9 of the things that happened to me were really, really positive things. All the people I met were really amazing people. Uh, and the second thing that I was kind of, that was an obstacle for me to start traveling was the most obvious thing. I didn't have almost any money. So I lost my job, I lost all the money I had. I even got a huge debt uh, after I quit my job. And I was like, okay, let me try to find these alternative ways of traveling. All these people that came to my place, they were traveling on a low budget. So I asked them, okay, what is the way that you travel? So they told me, it can be even cheaper to travel than live in your own home. 
They told me there are three major expenses while you travel. Pretty logical. You have transportation, traveling from point A to point B. You have accommodation, you have to sleep somewhere, of course. And then you have food, drinks, and so on. So I kind of, you know, wrote down all these, uh, all these things and tried them for myself. When it comes to transportation, most of the time I use hitchhiking. Everybody knows what that is, you know, it's pretty easy, it's free, it's fast. Uh, but the most important thing for me for hitchhiking was that I had an adventure between point A and point B. You know, my adventure didn't start when I came to a certain city. My adventure started when I left my apartment, when I raised my thumb, when somebody stopped and picked me up. And those people are amazing, you know, they can discover some facts about their own country, about their culture, maybe learn a couple of words, and so on and so on. I will play one short video called Hitchhiking Guide, just to let you know about some unwritten rules about hitchhiking. When it comes to hitchhiking, everything is about using common sense. Um, first, to start, you have to get out of the cities or villages or wherever you live and uh, start hitchhiking. So you have to be on the right road and going the right direction and it's really basic thing. Uh, lesson number two, stick up your thumb. Probably most of you have it, so you just do this. I have been searching. Uh, hitchhiking lesson number 36. Uh, look decent, like shave and stuff, and try to wear some like clean clothes, whatever, or hide behind your backpack so nobody sees what you look like. Uh, lesson number 54, uh, do not hitchhike during night. Be in a good mood. Uh, it's your choice. Hitchhiking. Don't be grumpy. Don't be like. Lesson number 58. Eye contact with the drivers. See? This one nearly stopped. So yeah, uh, don't hitchhike alone. I have uh, have a friend that I hitchhike with. Meet Maria Juana. This is she. Lesson number 21, talk with the drivers when you're in the car because that's the only way you can repay them. They, they would like to hear some interesting stories if you have one, yeah? If not, just listen to their story. That's sometimes enough. Lesson number nine, fasten your seatbelt if you have one. Hitchhiking lesson number 62, when the driver is asleep, take over. <laughs> Be always happy, you know, like, you're hitchhiking, it's your choice, and what if you sometimes look around? Be patient, and uh, don't expect people to stop, because you'll be wrong at 99.74% of cases. But no matter how long you wait, the right ride will come, so... That's the ultimate hitchhiking rule, and uh, that's all you have to know, man. There are no rules, actually. F*** all the rules. So, uh, yeah, go out there, enjoy your life, and uh, challenge yourself, eh? Feels alright. Now even breathing feels alright. Yes, even breathing. Uh, these are some of the unwritten rules about hitchhiking, but a lot of people don't want to hitchhike They're afraid they don't want to so there are other alternatives. For example, you can walk. It's also for free You just take your backpack and head to the road uh, You can if you have a bicycle you can bike around the world around your country or wherever Maybe it's not completely free because you have to buy the bicycle eventually fix it But it's much cheaper than these conventional methods of transportation 
You can also work in exchange for transportation. I did that when I was sailing across the Indian Ocean from Australia to Africa. I didn't have to pay for the ride, but I had to work in exchange for the ride. I had to raise sails, you know, I had to uh, keep night watches. For the first two days, I had to cook as well. And then the captain said, it's OK. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, you can use car relocation, which is thing, I'm not sure does it work in your country, but for example, if a rental car agencies have more cars in one place and less cars in others, then they, have, they give people for free to move the cars from point A to point B. Sometimes even they pay you gasoline and all the other expenses. There's also blah blah car, probably you heard about it as well. It's not completely free, but you can share rides with other people. Yesterday when we went to Hent, we were just looking at people, there was three of us in the car, and we're looking 99% of other cars, there was only one person inside. So it was, you know, things like blah blah car can be very, very useful. When it comes to accommodation, most of the time I use couch surfing because I had a lot of experience with it, you know. I had a lot of these positive references. I had many friends from all around the world that were willing to host me in their places. Of course, good things about couch surfing and few other websites that do the same thing are the, it's for free and you get to meet cool people and so on and so on. But for me and for many other people, the best thing about couch surfing is that you see a destination from a completely different perspective. So you're not staying in hotels, in hostels, you're not looking at your guide to know where you want to go that certain day for lunch or sightseeing and so on. You have your local guide, a guy or a girl that will tell you, you know, what to visit in their city, maybe take you out with their friends or maybe take you to, I don't know, Sunday family lunch and something like that. Uh, but there are also other alternatives to couch surfing. For example, you can camp. If you have your own tent, if you're not afraid of some wild animals or something, you always have your own home. If the weather is nice, also if you feel safe, you can sleep in parks. It's also something I did, not too many times, but still. Uh, you can also volunteer. You have so many opportunities from all around the world. Uh, there are also many websites as well uh, that you can apply and just look for volunteering opportunities. You can work in exchange for accommodation. Sometimes, most of the time, you even get free food, a couple of meals a day. Something I discovered recently is house sitting. So the principle is basic. Uh, somebody has a house and they're moving away for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months, and they don't want to leave the house empty. Because, I don't know, they're scared of burglars, they have a cat they, they need to feed, uh, they have some cows they need to milk or something, and then they look, people from on, they look people online, so people apply and stay in their house completely for free. One other thing is home exchange, uh, also something I discovered recently. Uh, if you have your own home, uh, you can exchange it with some other people from all around the world. For example, you have homeexchange.com as the biggest home exchange network in the world. And for example, you have a house in Brussels, I have an apartment in Zagreb. You, of course, want to come to Croatia, come to Zagreb, and I, I don't know why, would like to come to Brussels. Uh, so we just exchange our uh, homes, and I live in Brussels for a while, and you live in Zagreb and have an amazing time. Uh, when it comes to other expenses, food is the biggest expense. So I dealt with that by cooking or just, you know, buying food in supermarket and eating from the street and so on and so on. Cooking is an, an amazing thing because you can share so many stories. Sometimes you can cook for your host. Sometimes a host can cook for you, which is a much better uh, solution if you're traveling. Uh, and you can learn a lot about local uh, cuisine and stuff like that. Uh, another thing which is probably a bit too extreme for most of the people is dumpster diving. I didn't do it that many times, but you have to be aware that between 40 and 50% of the food that is being produced today is being thrown away. So a lot of people, you know, for example, big supermarkets, they throw away a lot of food after working hours. And then some people come there, take the food from them, or they wait till supermarkets throw the food in the bins, then they take it from there and eat. You can also have some alternative dumpster diving. It doesn't have to mean you have to dive into the dumpster. A couple of times when I was just passing through some streets and I see a pizza place, for example, and some people eating pizza, 
and then they pay, they don't finish their pizza, so you just come there and take a few slices, you know. Um, so, well, what? It's better than that it's being thrown away, right? When it comes to drinks, pretty usual, basic, you know, you avoid bars and restaurants and drink in parks, really. Uh, you just have to use logic, right? I'm not that smart. This is just pure logic, most of these things. Apart from being able to travel really cheaply, you can also earn money while traveling. For example, if you have a talent or if you, if you think you have a talent, for example, you can stay on the road, you know, play the guitar. Uh, I'm not really a musician, I know like five songs, you know, Bob Marley, of course, and uh, a few others. Um, but the most important thing is to have a story. I always had this small carton board where I, where I wrote, or somebody else wrote on the local language, hi, I'm Tom, I'm from Croatia, doing this, I need the money for this, blah, blah, blah. And that's what people like. That's when people are passing by, nobody will come in front of me and stop and listen to me sing or play the guitar, right? Maybe for some other people, but they will always check out what did you wrote. Uh, and sometimes they will give you a you know, couple of coins, maybe give you some sandwiches, maybe they give you some drinks, and so on, and so on. It won't, you won't get rich, of course, but it will definitely get you through the day. One other thing, you can, if you especially travel in some rich countries in a developed world, you can get a proper job. For example, when I was traveling in Australia, I, did, uh, I was a professional traffic diverter, which, uh, as you can see, is a really, really complicated job. I was standing there telling people, please go this way, not this way. Uh, I mean, if they are blind, so they don't see these, uh, these big signs, but whatever. And I was getting paid $20 an hour, which for Australia is pretty basic, right? The minimum wage in Australia back in 2011, 2012 was $16 an hour. And it took me only 13 days working at this job to pay off eight months of traveling. So when I started my round the world trip, I started from Croatia, hitchhiked through entire Asia, came to Australia. It lasted eight months and I was working 13 days and I earned as much as money as I spent in those eight months. You can also write. Uh, for me, it all happened by pure accident. Uh, when I started traveling, I never thought I would be a travel writer. In my Croatian classes, English classes, always was like a B student, C student, whatever. But when I went on the road, you know, I put a few photos on my personal Facebook profile, right? And then some people said, you know, oh, I really like your photos and your little comments, you know, we really have a feeling that we are there with you traveling. And they're like, oh, you, maybe you should do something about it. And I'm like, okay, I opened up a Facebook page, the little grew, you know, and that was five years ago, right? And then later the blog came, the web page, the YouTube channel. Last year I wrote my first book, so that's also how you can earn money while traveling. You can also get some sponsors as well, if you get a lot of uh, views on your website or your Facebook page, and so on, and so on. This was 1,000 Days of Summer. This was my biggest trip, my round the world trip that lasted from 2011 to 2014. Uh, and now I will tell you a few things about my round the world trip. So when I started, I had only two things. I had the direction where I wanted to go towards the east, or east, I have no idea where the east is, but still, and the second thing was three visas in my passport. I had a visa for Iran, I had a visa for Pakistan, and I had a visa for India. Those were the countries that I knew that I had to get a visa before leaving Croatia. And then one day, I think it was September 10th, I'm not thinking, I'm sure it was, 2011, I went to one pay tolls in east of Zagreb and just head to the east. First country I visited was Serbia. So you probably guys know the relationship between Croatians and Serbians is not the best, like Dutch people and Belgium probably, even, even worse. We had this unfortunate war, unfortunately, uh, beginning of the 90s, and uh, I was uh, feeling, you know, Maybe some people will have a problem because I'm Croatian, right? I have a pretty typical Croatian name, Tomislav. Um, but all the experiences I had there were just beautiful. People who picked me up, people who hosted me in their homes. They, it really proved me that the world is a really beautiful place. Uh, second country I visited was Bulgaria. This is the only picture I have from Bulgaria. I have a lot of countries, a lot of photos, so we have to, you know, uh, only the best ones. And this I like the most because this is Tanya. She's been traveling 
for ages and ages, hitchhiking with her dog, Nina. Uh, so I met her when I was uh, organizing this hitchhiking race. She's from Croatia as well, amazing, amazing woman. And this is, for me, you know, a lot of people tell me, you're a guy, you know, it's easy to travel for you, you know, you're a guy, it's easy to hitchhike, it's safe. Girls, uh, it would be impossible. Uh, Tanya and many other girls that I met during my travels are the proof that everybody can travel, even with a dog. Uh, dog actually gives you some perks. For example, Tanya, a couple of years ago, ended up on a yacht on, of one, uh, you probably know the Turkish football club guys, Galatasaray. The guy had a dog and he invited her and her dog Nina to his yacht because his dog fell in love with, uh, with her dog. <laughs> So yeah, bring your dog, you know, maybe you end up on a yacht of a Galatasaray owner or something. Uh, after Bulgaria, I visited Turkey, you know, it's a beautiful country. After chaos of Istanbul, which is like a really chaotic city, I don't know, 15, 20 million people live there. Uh, I visited Pamukkale, which is a beautiful place down south. I also spent some time in Cappadocia. Uh, I actually couch surfed in one of these stone houses. It was a really, really beautiful experience. And this is the photo I like the most uh, from many, many photos from all around the world because it actually proves what's traveling all about. Many people think, you know, traveling, you know, meeting a lot of uh, great people, uh, seeing beautiful places, eating food, you know, sipping cocktails on a beach in Thailand and so on. But hospitality of complete strangers and their kindness, that's the reason to travel because it completely tears down your prejudices and gives you a completely different perspective. These people had, like one of them spoke few words of English. They picked me up, you know, they invited me to their home, they made a huge feast and uh, I spent the night at their place and tomorrow I went further. But that was the point that I understood, okay, traveling is all about the people. Uh, after Turkey, I went to Iraq, uh, the northern part of Iraq, Kurdistan, Iraq. Uh, which back in the days, three years ago, was not as dangerous as I hear is today. Um, but still there were a lot of, like, you know, military uh, officers and so on, tanks on the road. Uh, sometimes uh, just in the lobbies of my room I can find, you know, many things like uh, this, I don't know what it is, it's not AK-47, but something similar. So you have to lock your room very, very tightly. But then again, after all these, you know, you see tanks, you see military, you see rifles in front of your room, you see something like this. This is one city of Dohuk, uh, Friday night, busy, busy street. And this guy has this big glass box, a lot of euros inside, a lot of uh, dollars, a lot of local currency. And I stop there and I'm like, what's this all about, man? Uh, he's like, this is an exchange office. Do you need me to change your money? I'm like, are you serious, man? This is Iraq, you know, like, aren't you afraid? Like, in my neighborhood, like, you wouldn't do this, you know, somebody will come and, like, rob you or kill you or something like that. And he looked at me, smiled, and said, but this is Kurdistan, Iraq, this is the safest country in the world. And he was right, you know, in his eyes, he had no negative experience. He can stand on the road with a bunch of money and just give it to other people in exchange for their money. And then I realized, couple of stories. Then I remembered a couple of stories from, from the beginning of my trip. When I was leaving Croatia, of course, you know, my parents, my friend, everybody was you know, very, very worried about me. You know, you're going to hitchhike all around the world for almost three years and so on and so on. Be very careful. You know, Croatia is okay. Yeah, like, you can travel in Croatia, not a big deal. People are great here. But as soon as you cross the border, enter into Serbia, you know what Serbians are like, you know, very dangerous, somebody might kill you. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'll be careful and enter into Serbia, beautiful, I told you, beautiful people, beautiful experiences. Um, and then when I was leaving Serbia, going towards Bulgaria, I was driving with one driver and I told him how Croatians were warning me about Serbia. And he looked at me, he smiled and he said, brother, we are Croatians, Serbians, we're all brothers, you know. But Bulgarians, oh, uh, now you're going towards Bulgaria, you know what Bulgarians are like, be very careful, somebody might kill you. I'm like, okay, you know, I'll be careful, and I come into Bulgaria again. Beautiful people, amazing experiences, people picking me up, taking me out, hosting me in their homes. And I was leaving Bulgaria, going towards Turkey, and I was telling 
the guy, my driver, the same story. And uh, he, he smiled at me and he said, Croatians, Serbians, Bulgarians, we're all Balkan brothers, you know, you have nothing to worry about. But Turkish people, oh my God, when you go into Turkey, you know, you know how Turkish people are very dangerous, somebody might kill you. Turkish people warned me about Kurdish people, Kurdish people about Iranis, Iranis about Pakistanis, Pakistanis about Indians, Indians warned me about other Indians, you know, I have had nothing else probably <laughs> to warn me about. But it kind of proved my point that all these horror stories that you hear from the media, from people that never been to certain countries, you always have to think with your own head, they're probably not true. Uh, after Iraq, I visited Iran. Uh, Iran was cool. Uh, the first thing I learned in Iran was uh, you cannot hitchhike like this, because this in Iran means this, right? <laughs> but the second thing in Iran was nobody understood what hitchhiking was all about. So there was me on this border, you know, city, and I was standing with this sign that some guy wrote to me, you know, Tehran, I was really proud. And first guy came up to me, he's like, what, what, what are you doing? You know, I'm like, I'm going hitchhiking to Tehran. He's like, bus station, bus station. He wanted to take me to the bus station. I'm like, no, 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 if somebody goes there, you know. He, like, he gave up and walked away. Second guy, second guy came up to me and like, taxi, you need taxi? I'm like, no, 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 you know, somebody go in there. I'm trying to explain them, nobody gets any idea. And the third guy was the best one. Uh, he came up to me and he said, I don't know from which country you are from, but you don't have to hold the signs. We have signs over there, you know, so <laughs> it's okay, you know. <laughs> we know where Tehran is, you know, are you okay, you know? <laughs> And I'm like, this is going to be a long, long day, right? Um, so I just quit, I went to the bus station, and then I realized why nobody's hitchhiking in Iran, because the petrol cost and the buses were so cheap that everybody can afford a bus ride for like 1,000 kilometers for just a couple of dollars. So this was the first time I used the buses. Not all the time, of course, I hitchhike. Sometimes I use the planes as well, but a, a bit more about that later. Uh, when it comes to Iran, the first thing, you probably know, and the first thing I knew about Iran is a different culture. So it's an Islamic Republic. Uh, some other rules apply. For example, women always have to have uh, covered heads and like the ankles and so on. If you go into the bus, women go on the back of the bus, which for me, it was really, really strange. Um, but what I didn't know about Iran that many, many people that I met were kind of against these strict rules. You know, they wanted a little bit of freedom. You know, they didn't necessarily agree with their religious leaders. I also stayed with one family while couch surfing, even though couch surfing is illegal in Iran, but a lot of people, you know, they do some things online, so I don't know, routers, whatever. Um, and I stayed with them and they told me a story about their son who used to, went to go, go on one protest in Iran. He was just, he had a tape over his mouth and few of them protested in the middle of the street for them not having like a right to talk, to express themselves. And what the government did, they put snipers on the roof, killed a couple of them, including their son, and that was it. That's how protesting in Iran used to be. I'm not sure is it today, but listening to these stories, you know, I realized that Iran is not religious leaders. Iran is not politicians, you know, same as in Belgium, same as in Croatia. If somebody compares me personally with my politicians, I wouldn't like that, you know. But we are doing similar things to Iran, to Pakistan, to some other country we have no idea about. We never met anyone from there. And for me, that was a big surprise, you know. All already tore down a lot of prejudices that I had before. Uh, as I mentioned, people are amazing. Everybody, like, if anybody has been here in Iran, probably they can confirm the story that Iran, Irani people probably the most hospitable people, the most hospitable nation in the world. Even though I don't like to generalize, but I have to agree with that one, with Iran. People are very well educated. I've never met anyone who's not at least like an engineer or something. A lot of them speak really good English and so on. And they're really interested about foreigners, you know, what are you doing in my country? Can I offer you some chai? And they want to talk to you about many, many other things. I was in Persepolis, which is like an uh, important historical site when you're going uh, towards, uh, towards Pakistan. But somehow, uh, culture, history was never my priority when I traveled. 
I know probably I missed on many things, you know, not going to see these historical places and so on, but I was always thinking that I was missing many things. I was missing meeting other people, talking with them, if I start reading about history, going to some historical sites and so on. So people were always on the top of my priority. Then I entered into Pakistan. Uh, actually, it wasn't that easy. Uh, there was something wrong with my visa, so I had to spend three days with uh, uh, Irani military and their police officers and so on. It was really hard. Fortunately, there was this couch surfer just 25 kilometers away from the border, and he took me in. Uh, he hosted me in his dental laboratory. It was kind of spooky. Uh, and there was he with his friend smoking opium all day long. So I was like, okay, you know, new experience. Uh, so it was, it was interesting. Of course, I didn't try, mom. Uh, so, but it was, it was interesting. Uh, first thing you see in Pakistan, people speak less English. They're less educated than Iranis. Uh, the roads are uh, in worse shape, but still their hospitality, their openness, their curiosity is just glowing from their eyes. Even though I was passing through this Baluchistan region, which is kind of a dangerous even for Pakistanis to go there, uh, I had my own uh, personal guide, you know, a, an army guy uh, following me with this rifle, whatever it is, even though I have no idea would he be able to like defend me, I would probably have to defend him, he's like 100 years old or something. But still, people were really hospitable, really curious, like, what are you doing here? You know, how do you like Pakistan? And so on and so on. I didn't spend that much time in Pakistan. I was hurrying towards India because my visa was kind of expiring, so I wanted to come there as soon as possible. And I came to India. This entire trip from Croatia to India lasted only a month and a half. And in India, I spent almost four months. This was my first experience with India, Indian trains. Uh, I can write uh, the entire book about Indian trains. Uh, this is uh, the last, you have the first class, second class, 31st class. This is the last class, he has, he has no name, I think. Uh, this is the class where you go, come in when you don't have any reservation and so on. So you can see people sleeping where you bring the luggage and stuff like that. So everybody's just all around the floor, lying down, walking around and so on. Um, I was fortunate so I can stand there. I stood there uh, for seven hours. It was a really, really long ride. Uh, I was kind of tired, but few things happened to me that kind of determined what my idea and my experience of India will be. So I was standing here, you know, around me, there was a bunch of children, you know, like sitting down, there was this little girl, like 11 years old, she was holding a baby, like two months, here, uh, two months old, and they were like all sleeping, and everybody was like sharing some food and water and so on. And in the middle of the night, I was just standing there and I felt something dripping on my, uh, dripping on my feet, and I realized that this little baby was peeing on me, right? <laughs> My first reaction was shock. You know, I never got anyone peeing on me, at least not without asking them to, but uh, it was, <laughs> er erase that from your memory. Uh, no, it was, it was a really, you know, new thing for me. I was shocked. And my first reaction would be, you know, to move my feet, but I couldn't do it because it was, so, it was stuck between so many people. And then I just held my breath. I was like, okay, you came to India, you have to play by their rules. That didn't mean that I would be going around, oh, please pee on my foot and stuff like that, <laughs> but it meant that I shouldn't judge, that I'm not there to teach them how they should live. I'm there to learn. Maybe they have a completely different lifestyle than me, maybe they have, they're culturally completely wrong, maybe, you know, they don't have diapers. So, you know, what the baby will do, you know, like we'll wait till you go out on toilet, no. Uh, so I, that was kind of a completely mind change for me. So it was just accept the fact that you came, that you are a guest and try to learn, don't teach, don't preach to people, you know, we, in Europe we are more civilized, we're smarter than you, you should do this, you should do that. When you come to a certain country, you are there to learn and you have to be modest because you won't last long if you're not. Uh, first place in India where I stayed a bit longer was this permaculture farm just under the Himalayas. I, I was volunteering there. I needed to stop for a while, recharge my batteries. Uh, my friends were volunteering on this permaculture farm, so I stayed a couple of weeks there. 
also visited Varanasi, the holiest Indian city. I call it like India in small, you know, like if you have to visit only one city in India, I would probably suggest Varanasi. Uh, the river Ganges, or Ganges, uh, what's it called? Uh, a lot of people come here to die so they can put their ashes into the river. The river itself, it's it, the holiest river in India, but it's the dirtiest as well. I think it's the dirtiest river in the world because there are a lot of like uh, body parts floating around and uh, cows and stuff like that. But still, people bathe in it, people wash their clothes, some people even drink it and so on. I was really sick in Varanasi. I didn't drink the water from Ganges, but I was sick. Uh, I was sick a little bit in Iran. I was sick a little bit uh, in Pakistan. But when I came to India, it was horrible. You know, three days just in my hostel room, like $2 room, and I was just going to the toilet and back and drinking a lot of water. And this was the moment when I was healthy. I came to the gut in Varanasi. I just sat there, and I looked at all this colorfulness and people just living their lives, and I was really happy that I was healthy. And then also one thing struck me, you know, being grateful. I'm never grateful, you know, or not most of the time, because, you know, you take things for granted, you know. Being healthy is something we don't even think about, you know. We are now, 99% of us are pretty healthy. You understand that only when you are sick. So those kind of things when happen to you while you're traveling, for example, if you are sick, it's kind of a cool experience because you, you remind yourself that you should be much more grateful on an everyday basis. Of course, I visited some you know, sites everybody knows of, everybody visits, so I visited Taj Mahal. Um, one, a friend of mine had a couple of elephants, a couch surfer, so I was with him, to, like playing with his elephants and so on. Uh, I visited Munar, uh, tea plantations in the south, south of India. I visited uh, Alipi, which has these beautiful uh, backwaters, so you can sail in the canoes. So India is not like just a bunch of people in Mumbai or in Delhi, you know, poor people, like slumdog millionaire, you know, on the street and so on. India is amazing. India is huge. So even when I tell people I was almost four months in India, they were like, oh, what were you doing there so much time, you know? But if you have four years in India, it wouldn't be enough to explore the, other, the, the entire country. And then I took my first flight. I couldn't cross the border on, uh, over land uh, in Myanmar, in Burma. So I took like $50 flight to uh, Kuala Lumpur and spent next two months in Thailand. First thing about Thailand, it struck me the beauty of the nature, their uh, coast, their sand, their uh, beaches, their food, which was really, really amazing. Uh, first time I hitchhiked a boat, which was a really cool experience. It was just a joke, actually. We're, we're walking around uh, the island and we saw some uh, guys and we're like, oh, let's hitchhike a boat. And they actually came and picked us up and drove us to the other side of the island. Uh, this is how hitchhiking in Thailand looks like. Everybody drives pickup, pickup trucks, so you just have to hop on the back and when you see the road is going different direction, you just tap, tap and you go up. I was there doing Songkran, which is a Thai celebration of New Year. It happens usually in April, if I'm not mistaken, and it lasts for three or four days. And they celebrate it by throwing water on each other, like celebrating new season is coming and so on. Everybody drives around again in their pickup trucks. They have these big barrels filled with water. Sometimes they even put like ice inside, so it's ice bucket challenge everywhere all the time. So it was a really fun experience. A lot of you know, uh, drinking, a lot of uh, dancing, a lot of food, and so on. I also spent some time in a Buddhist monastery up north. It's called Forest Monastery. And it was also a really cool experience. You have to kind of adjust to their lifestyle. This was a Vipassana monastery. Um, for example, the food is vegan, so there are no uh, meat products. Uh, you have to wake up around 5, 6 a.m. Uh, the last meal is at noon, so there's no food in the afternoon. Uh, you go meditation like eight or nine hours a day, which can be really a big challenge. And I had no idea, for example, you have three types of meditation. You have the normal one, you know, sitting down meditation. Uh, you have walking meditation. And actually my favorite, uh, lying down meditation. Uh, this was, I was the best student uh, when it came to this. You know, I was so very well concentrated that you know, nobody could wake me up. Uh, in Thailand, the first time in my career, in my hitchhiking career, I drove the car of a guy that I hitchhiked because the guy was completely drunk. And I realized when he was, he was trying to open up a beer can from, 
from a different side. So I was like, oh, turn it around, man. Like, you're so drunk. And I'm, when I saw that, I'm like, I don't really want to drive with this guy. So I'm like, well, I'm from Croatia. We drive on the other side. I never drove a pickup. So please, can I drive a little bit? He's like, yes, of course. You know, he gave me the keys. And he went back and fell asleep, of course. So it was also a cool new experience to drive a car that I hitchhiked. I uh, also visited one orphanage uh, close to the border with Myanmar. Um, these are two or three hundred children that don't, don't have any papers, no names, no Th Thailand doesn't want them, Myanmar doesn't want them, so it's a pretty bad experience, but they're also really, really happy, you know, when they see you. Uh, they depend on a lot of volunteers that come there and uh, spend a couple of months. I was only there for a couple of days, but it was a really nice experience. And now, it was done with Asia, and I went to Australia. Also bought a plane ticket. It was, I think, $90 Air Asia, which is pretty cheap, especially if you fly to the other side of Australia, which is nine-hour flight. Uh, I visited Sydney. I had some relatives there. I was looking for work. Because I spent some money, you know, I wanted to earn some money, especially now since I'm in Australia. But first month, I couldn't find any work. So I kind of gave up. You know, I moved out of Sydney, and let's go travel a little bit around Australia. And the second day I was hitchhiking, a guy picked me up and I told him I'm looking for work. He's like, yeah, sure, I can give you work, you know, come with me. And he took me to his house. Uh, I spent the next three weeks with his, uh, with his son and him and he gave me work. That was that professional traffic diverter I was working. I was also helping him. He was a painter. Uh, we were painting some hotel in the middle of Brisbane. I was holding his letter and those like really hard jobs. So uh, after a few weeks, I was rich, you know, I earned some money so I could travel around Australia. Cool thing about Australia is that the distances between the cities and the areas are really long. So when somebody picks you up, it's a really big chance that they will drive you for many, many kilometers. I actually had three rides longer than 1,500 kilometers, which is only in Australia. You know, those were my records that were probably will never uh, never beat. Uh, for example, these two French guys, I drove with them a couple of, uh, couple of days, you know, we spend the nights on the road, just in some uh, drive-bys and so on and so on. We visited Uluru, which was really magical. I'm not sure have you guys been there, but if you ever go to Australia, it's really a magical place. Uh, maybe you know uh, the story about Aboriginals, which is kind of a sad story, not kind of, really, really sad story, this was their most sacred place. So there's this weird energy about Uluru. So if you go there, definitely visit. Uh, you can also, you know, do some touristy stuff. Uh, on the north, there's like camels in Broome where you can just walk around. Uh, beautiful sunsets, which were really on a nice romantic. I was there by myself, I didn't know, but I was taking photos of other people. So, but it was nice, it was nice. I would like to go back maybe one day. Uh, I visited 12 Apostles down south and then I came to Melbourne after almost three months of traveling around Australia, and I found a job there. Uh, I worked in one uh, kitchen as a kitchen hand, you know, work as a minimum paid, $16 an hour. Uh, I was working, uh, I was living with, uh, with nine other people, so I didn't even have to pay for the rent, and I wanted to stay in Melbourne. You know, I kind of was tired a little bit of traveling. You know, I was traveling nonstop for almost, for over a year now. And I was like, okay, maybe Melbourne will be a good base to just chill out, maybe earn some money, pay off my debt, and so on and so on. Um, and I did it for a couple of weeks, and I had this cool plan, you know, stay in Melbourne. But there's a saying, you know, if uh, you want to make the God laugh, you just tell him your plans. Um, and then he sent me this guy online that uh, wanted me to help him to sail across the Indian Ocean. Uh, and I was like, Damn, you know, like uh, I had this cool opportunity to stay in Melbourne, but on the other hand, this amazing opportunity to sail across the ocean, you know, to hitchhike a boat. So I'm like, okay, the, this guy asked me, you know, do you have some experience? I'm like, man, I'm from Croatia, you know, we have many islands. My biggest experience was like ferry, you know, from Split to the first <laughs> island. I didn't tell him that, but you know, how hard can it be to sail across the Indian Ocean, right? Um, and then I met up with this guy, a uh, 13-meter yacht, uh, four people on the boat, including me. So there was a captain, he was American, uh, there was this girl, she was Chinese, and there was Sebastian, he was Belgian. Uh, we started sailing, uh, and it was fun for the first day. Uh, and then, you know, a little bit of seasickness, and then you don't see anything besides, you know, the sea and the sky. Uh, 
and then f after five days it was cool because we reached the first island. We reached Cocos Islands, which was a really nice experience to see the land after five days of not seeing anything. But especially when we came closer and when the sun came up and when we uh, came closer to the, to the beach and we could see these beautiful colors, uh, this was probably, besides Uluru, the most beautiful place that I have ever seen visually. Uh, the beaches were just, you know, paradise. Uh, the really, really tiny sand. Uh, only 600 people lived there. As like many islands, there are not even, uh, there are no people there and so on. But the other side of the story, we were there for only two days. We had to go further. We had over 40 days sailing to reach South Africa, which was our final destination. I will actually show you one, uh, one video about uh, this sailing across the Indian Ocean, so you can see how amazing and adventurous uh, sailing across the Indian Ocean is. After two days enjoying in paradise, we're leaving Cocos Island and heading towards Mauritius, like three weeks of sailing probably. So this is actually the last land we'll see in the next three weeks. Uh, good luck to us. Number, I don't know, I think it's around 15 since we left uh, Cocos Islands. Yeah, every day has been pretty much the same. Uh, we wake up, have breakfast, we read, we have lunch, <laughs> we go shit, and uh, yeah, we do night watches and uh, we sleep. And we sleep a couple of more times during the day. Once we caught a fish. Oh. Very happy day. Once we caught a plastic bag, which wasn't really a happy day. Yeah, very, very fun. I would recommend uh, to sail across Indian Ocean uh, to everyone. It's really fun. Fun. Very. But yeah, we should be soon in Mauritius in four days. And uh, yeah, we will be nice to touch land again. And then off to South Africa. Woo! Waka waka eh eh sam nam na taliba. It's time for Africa. <laughs>
As you can see, you go crazy when you when you sail too much. Don't sail, people. This is horrible. It's horrible. After 45 days of sailing, we reached South Africa. I kissed the ground, and I went up north. Uh, I hitchhiked through Swaziland, which is a really, really small country between South Africa and Mozambique. Um, I spent a few weeks in Mozambique as well. This was one of the places that I spent the night in Mozambique. There are not a lot of couch surfers in Africa. Most of them are expats, so people from the States, Australia, and so on and so on. They're like working there, volunteering and stuff. So you have to sometimes improvise and sleep in places like this. Usually when people ask me like, what's the best or strangest or the most dangerous place you've ever slept? I, most of the time I tell them, oh, I slept under a truck in Mozambique. You know, it sounds really Mozambique, you know? It sounds really dangerous, right? Um, but what I want to say is like, these things are nothing sensational, you know? I'm not the most adventurous guy in the world. These kind of things, you know, where I'm sleeping, it's not like I'm trying to be adventurous, I'm so courageous. I'm just, you know, doing something that's practical, you know? I came there in the middle of the night in some village, and there were a lot of people like in bars and drinking, and I found a police station because I felt safe close to the police station and because it was raining I just put my mattress under the under the truck um, so what I want to say actually with this photo and many other photos that what I did is nothing sensational most of you guys can do the same thing so that's something I want you to think about you know uh, I visited Malawi which was my favorite place in Africa I spent one month in one place called Cape McClear. I volunteered there, worked in one, uh, one guest house, and it was pretty cool. Recharged my batteries after sailing across the Indian Ocean. Visited some other places in Malawi, hanged out with the locals, how you usually do it. Uh, crossed the border of Malawi and Tanzania with some sugar smugglers, which was also a kind of cool experience, even though I didn't have a visa when I came to Tanzania, so I had to go to some guy's office in the middle of the night to get a visa. He, you have to bribe them and so on and so on. I spent some time in an uh, orphanage in Tanzania that was run by uh, Croatian, uh, Croatian volunteers. And then the best thing ever happened, uh, almost of my entire trip, I was visited by my dad. Uh, it was uh, already 500 days have passed, I haven't been home. I've seen my parents on Skype, you know, and stuff like that. So um, when I was coming actually to Africa, I thought of my dad and I remembered how when we were kids, I mean, when I was a kid, my dad wasn't a kid uh, back then, we were watching like Discovery Channel and those kind of things. And whenever we were watching safaris from Africa, my dad was like, wow, you know, like one time in my life I would love to go to Africa on a safari. My dad never traveled in his life. He flew only once from Zagreb to Split, like 45 minute flight. Um, he never speaks any other language than, uh, than Croatian. I told him, Dad, you should come to Kenya. I knew my mom won't come. She, she doesn't want to fly ever, no matter how long. Maybe if she doesn't see me 20 years, maybe she will think about it. But I was like, Dad, come, you know, I have some money I earned in Australia. I have these sponsors, you know, so I can afford to pay you a trip to Kenya. Let's go on a safari. And he was like, okay, let's, let's meet up. And my dad came after like 500 days of me traveling around the world and not seeing him. It was a really cool experience. The first thing I did, I took him hitchhiking because he was always the biggest opponent of me hitchhiking. Like, uh, like every parent probably, if they see their child, they wouldn't probably suggest that you go hitchhiking around the world. But I knew he wouldn't like it. So I was like, okay, how can I do it, you know, so he doesn't even know. Um, so I told him, like, oh, let's wait for the bus. But you, like, hitchhike, I will send, like, take a few pictures of you and send it to mom so she thinks we're hitchhiking, ha ha. And he stood like that, and he was like, yeah, okay, no problem, no problem. Um, so I was like, you know, tick, tick, tick. And the light is not good today. And five minutes I was like, he was, uh, his arm was hurting, and the first car stops. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no auto, stop, bus, bus. That's the only word he knows in English because the same is in Croatian. Um, and I'm like, Dad, come on, this is Africa. Who knows when the next bus will come, you know? So he's like looking, you know, looking at the driver, a black guy, you know? He never, <laughs> he never, never saw a black guy in person, you know? So he's like suspicious a little bit. He's looking at the car. 
He's like, okay, it's a Renault. Okay, let's go. <laughs> so it was something, you know, he, he can associate with himself. So he sat in the car, drove for like 50 kilometers, and it was pretty cool. He never hitchhiked again, but it was, it was definitely worth it. And then we went on a, you know, nice safari trip. You know, we visited a few national parks, saw rhinoceros, elephants, uh, giraffes, uh, lions, and so on, and so on. We hanged out with, with Maasai warriors as well, so it was, it was really cool for my Batman dad, you know. Um, and then I got the news that my brother was getting married. It was like, oh, you know, I really want to attend my brother's wedding, but I still want to, you know, travel a little bit. But I was like, you know, fuck it, I'll just go and return a little bit to Croatia. So I flew back with my dad, attended my brother's wedding. I was like, okay, my trip is still not finished, you know. I want to go to South America. That was, that's something that really draws me the most. So I bought a plane ticket that didn't want to hitchhike a boat again, even though I had an offer from when I came to South Africa to get a boat from South Africa to Caribbeans, but I kind of didn't want to do that after 45 days of sailing. So I just bought a plane ticket to Peru. Uh, and I flew there. Uh, I wasn't by myself. I met this girl in Croatia. We had like 19 days to hang around before, before, we, before I go to, to Peru. And I'm like, oh, I like you, know, maybe you want to join me? And she's like, yeah, sure, whatever. But I really, I'm a really convincing guy. So she, she said yes. And after 16, actually 18 days, we went to South America. Uh, we visited Peru. Our first place we visited was Mancora, uh, where we volunteered, worked a couple of hours a day in exchange for accommodation and food. And this beautiful view was from, from our room. It was a really, really beautiful place. Uh, we just worked a couple of hours a day, you know, painting, uh, doing all things around this hotel, guest house, whatever it was. Uh, great thing about Peru is it has four different areas. You have the beach, you have the desert, you have the mountains, and you have the jungle. So you can see everything by staying in only one country. Uh, the biggest challenge was uh, to cross the Andes, their, uh, their mountain range. It was hardcore, you know, those are like death roads, you know, you probably heard about before, but we met so many people, you know, locals that do this on a on an everyday basis and so on. We also visited uh, the jungle close to Iquitos, There's this small place called Tamshiaku. We actually met uh, I think four or five Croatian people. This was like the first time we met meet Croatian people in, in South America and they bought this huge chunk of land. It was 11 acres. And we were like, wow, you know, it's really beautiful. They have their own lake and small huts and palm trees and so on. And I spoke to this guy and I'm like, how much did you pay for it? He's like, ah, oh, don't ask me, you know, too much. You know, they, it was a really high price for this area. I'm like, how much, how much is it? And he's like, 9,000 euros. And I'm like, <laughs> Seriously? 11 acres? Like two square meters in Zagreb cost 9,000 euros, right? So uh, the only bad thing were the mosquitoes, but when you, when you think about it, it was a really, really beautiful place. Uh, we had uh, our own shaman from a local Shipibo tribe. Uh, we tried ayahuasca ceremonies. Uh, it's a long story. Probably some of you are interested how, uh, how was it ayahuasca. I won't be talking about it because it's a it's a long story, it's a very personal experience, uh, but you have a lot of stories on my blog. I will take, to, talk about it a bit later. Um, we also visited Machu Picchu. You can't come to Peru without visit, visiting Machu Picchu, right? Uh, but since the train was really, really expensive, we decided to walk uh, from uh, Olla and Taitambo all the way to Agos Caliente to Machu Picchu Pueblo. Uh, this was for free because you just walk along the tracks. Um, it was a nice experience for the first couple of kilometers, then the night fell down and we didn't have any torches, we didn't bring any camping equipment, then some dogs were barking around us, we were really scared uh, shitless and I uh, had my laptop fortunately which we could like point the, the light in front of us so we can see where we walk. Uh, I actually made a short video, three minutes, about uh, Cusco and about uh, our trip to Machu Picchu so we can watch it all together. Hey, 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 hey guys, it's me again. Today we're going to Peru, to one of its most famous cities, Cusco. Back in the days, Cusco was the capital of the Inca Empire. But sometimes in the 16th century, 200 Spanish soldiers came and with the help of smallpox, conquered them all. There is a lot to be told about the history of Cusco. 
for example, about the last Inca ruler, Tupac Amaru. West Coast, yeah, West Coast! But you can look it up online. Spaniards built churches all around the country and turned Cusco in what it is today. The most beautiful city in Peru, popular tourist destination and UNESCO World Heritage Site. Since Cusco is on 3,400 meters above sea level, the first thing you'll notice here is altitude sickness. How to cope with that? Simple. Coca leaves. Natural medicine that grows on the trees here. And if you ingest it correctly, your body feels normal again. But the main reason people visit Cusco is not because of the city or coca leaves, it's because of Machu Picchu. The only thing you have to watch out are the tunnels. Present you the one and only Machu Picchu. Everything about this site is very well known, and even though you have seen millions of pictures of it, the view from the top will leave everyone breathless. So here you go. Just enjoy. enjoyed Cusco and Machu Picchu. See you some other time. We've also visited uh, Huacachina, a small oasis, a beautiful oasis in Peru in a desert. And this was over four months of traveling in Peru. And in this place, something interesting happened. I started writing a book. After five years of traveling, after writing many blogs and uh, putting photos on Facebook page and so on, making videos, I was kind of tired of traveling, I just wanted to sit down and I wanted to make a book. Um, I never considered myself to be a travel writer, but I started, I'm like, okay, let's finish this. Uh, let's find a place where we could be like for a couple of months where I will be focused on writing the book. And we found it in Ecuador, small village, uh, fishing village of Santa Marianita, and we spent the next five months there. We were volunteering, working in the kitchen, you know, cleaning the rooms, in exchange for food and accommodation. We were also uh, taking care of five dogs and 12 cats that the owner had. It was also quite quite new experience. Um, it was a really small village, just a few hundred people lived there. We had our own family, you know, we went uh, every night to their place uh, for dinner. For only $2 you get like fresh fish and side dish and some salad and so on and so on. Uh, we didn't travel that much in Ecuador because I was quite busy uh, with writing my book. This was my, my place where I wrote the book. And after five months of writing, 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 I closed my laptop and I said, Maria, I'm finished, let's go home. Uh, it turned out that 1,000 days of summer were just, were just over, so we came back home uh, and I published my book. Uh, the book is called 1,000 Days of Spring, and now a lot of people say, well, what's up with that? You know, did you misspell the title? You know, it's a thousand days of summer, you know? Uh, but the story goes like this. When, when I started writing the book, my idea was to write a book called Thousand Days of Summer that will talk about my round the world trip because I thought this is the most interesting thing for the people who will read it. Uh, but I, I wanted to write about how it all started. I wanted to start the book without how I quit my job as a stockbroker, my nine to five job and so on. I wanted to write about 
my first couch surfing experience. I wanted to write about my first hitchhiking experience, about my relationship with my parents, about my university, about my first big trip in Europe, second big trip in Europe, a hitchhiking race, trip to Bangladesh, blah, blah, blah. And when I started writing about how I started my round the world trip, I realized that I already have over 200 pages. And I'm like, okay, this is maybe two books. Um, and before, because I was talking about a period before 1,000 Days of Summer, it was obvious that the book should be called 1,000 Days of Spring because it tells a story about three years before the actual trip around the world. I self-published the book. I didn't want to find a publisher because I already have had a bunch of people following me. So I was like, if these people were reading my stories for free for the last five years, maybe some of them will be interested to give some money for, for my book. I'd made an Indiegogo campaign, which is really successful. I managed to uh, get money for editing the book, for designing, for translating to English, uh, printing a couple of copies. And then I went around Croatia, I was holding lectures about my round the world trip and promoting my book. I visited over 60, 60 cities in Croatia and neighboring countries, uh, and that was fun. Uh, but then the autumn was coming, uh, and uh, I got an invitation to attend uh, one TEDx conference, which was held in Hamburg just exactly one year ago. Um, and that was really amazing, you know, I had 18 minutes to tell my life story, to tell my idea worth spreading. And it went viral, you know, I had over 800,000 views up till now, and uh, that's how most of the people, you know, find, find me online and my story, uh, and so on. Uh, but then, you know, since winter was coming, we didn't want to spend the winter in Croatia, so we went to New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand, a beautiful country. I will have only two slides from New Zealand, even though we spent seven months uh, living there. We went there on a working holiday visa, so it wasn't really like traveling, traveling, traveling. We wanted to maybe move to New Zealand to find a new, to get a new start, you know, to grow some roots, to find some job. We met amazing people, even though it was pretty different than people from Asia, Africa, and, uh, and South America. This uh, house was one of the directors of Lord of the Rings. Uh, he gave us his house for like a home exchange and so on and so on. And when I came back, when we came back to Croatia, that was five, six months ago, uh, we decided to stay in Zagreb. It was, it was kind of a strange, a strange idea because the winter is coming and we were thinking, oh, maybe we should go down south. I didn't, I didn't have a Christmas in Zagreb in six years. But then two things actually happened. One was the most important. Um, we stopped looking. We stopped expecting to find the perfect place. You know, because that's what you do sometimes. You know, when you travel, you you're trying to find a perfect place where you will be able to stay, you know, where the climate will be beautiful, when the food will be beautiful, when people will be amazing, where it will be cheap, and so on and so on. But I realized that no matter how much you try and search and look and so on, there will always be something a little bit, you know, they won't be perfect. And then I was like, Maybe we should just choose one place without thinking too much and try to make perfect conditions in that place. And after traveling the world, after five, six years of being on the road, Zagreb was like a logical choice. You know, our, my, our parents are there, our friends are there. Let's give it a chance. You know, we, we gave chance to so many countries, to so many cities around the world. So we decided to stay in Zagreb. Uh, I have my keys now, first time in five years. So it's a, it's a really new adventure, new experience. So yeah, I would like to finish with one thought. Um, I found it on a magnet in, in New Zealand. And it says, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? Just try to imagine, uh, five, six years ago, I was really desperate. I was broke, I had no, uh, had no job, I was $35,000 in debt. So I was like, if I imagine now how my life looks like now, I, wouldn't, I couldn't imagine it five, six years ago. But it was all because of one simple thing that I just went for it. You know, I, I, I knew that something good will happen. That I knew that if I give 100% of myself into something, and my thing was traveling, my thing was writing about it, my thing was taking pictures, spreading the idea that I actually had from my couch surfers, you know, uh, trying to make 
a world a little bit better place. You know, maybe it sounds like a utopia or something, but it was like that. So that's something I would like to ask you. So what would you do if you knew you could not fail? You know, what would you do if you knew you could dedicate the next five years of your life? And if you knew that you will succeed, what would you do? So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Woo.